Thank you for choosing CTN. And now, it's time with Herman and Sharon. I love you. Thank you so much for joining us. Sharon is in Wisconsin. And this is a four-part series that we're doing on the rainforest. And you can hear, hear, hear the sound. Mm -hmm. Doesn't it sound just like we're there? And uh, we want you to join us. This is the fourth one, but let me tell you, you can, if you didn't watch one through four, you can get your own DVD through Michael Pink. You'll go to his website and you'll order your own copy, but I'm suggesting that not only do you order your DVD, but probably first you order the book. That's why I am so motivated to do what we're doing in this four part series. And I believe that you will never be the same when you understand God's creation was put here for the very purpose that somehow you discovered. When did that door first open to you about this rainforest strategy? I went on a trip, I, I was praying at home and I felt like the Lord in my quiet time invited me to go to Panama. I had no idea why. I asked him why. I felt it had something to do with finance yeah. business, I, so I didn't know. Um, I asked him when. He said, make haste and go. So I, I, I made immediate plans that day, wow. booked the tickets, and went to a country I'd never been to and never knew anybody who had ever lived there, been there, did a church there, nothing. I knew nobody. Um, but I went. So you were driven. Uh, by the Lord. I, I, yeah, I went. To, the way I, I feel like it, it was an invitation. Okay. I've got something to show you. Wow. Go to the rainforest. I, like I, I got something to show you. I like that. You're, you're wanting to know my ways? Yeah. I got something I'll show wow. you. So that's what happened. And I went down to, the, to, to Panama. I didn't know it was about the rainforest. So I'm, I'm doing different things there. And I'm wondering why I'm here. And then one day when I'm, I, I, I stopped and I saw a plant with a leaf that it's like it's three-dimensional. It had architecture to it, it had design to it. It was the most gorgeous leaf I'd ever seen on a plant. And people walk by like it's not even there. And I'm thinking, don't you see that leaf? Yeah. Look at this thing. And I was just, I, I, I'm crazy this way, but I looked at that leaf, I remember this, I wept. Just yeah. not, I don't mean cried, yeah. I just mean like, like, God, this is amazing yeah. what you do. Yeah. And you know, and I was just so struck by the things that he made and the design of it. And as I was walking to go get some breakfast, that's when he spoke to me, he said, son, everything you need to learn about business, you can learn in the rainforest. And that set me on a quest. And what I found as I began my first thing, and then we'll carry on, is this, that I assumed the rainforest was, had great soil because that's the capital, the resource it's got to work with. Yeah. But it turned out that the soil was very poor quality, very shallow because the rain washes it away. It's somewhat acidic. So the question begs and says, how does God produce abundance? Because the rainforest is the most abundant system on the planet. The second most abundant system is a thousand times less abundant. That's the Great Barrier Reef. So it's a thousand times more abundant in the rainforest. How does God get abundance from scarcity, from having hardly anything to work with? How does he do that? And the answer to that question is what every business person, what every home manager, every household manager, every housewife, every husband, everybody that manages anything needs to know how do I get abundance from scarcity and that's what got me on this quest. You know uh, the Opryland <coughs> Hotel in Nashville Tennessee you folks that are watching in Nashville mm -hmm. you've got your rainforest I mean yeah. I've walked through there so <coughs> many times and I've done just what you just said uh, these orchids that are actually look like they're suspended in air mm -hmm. and I will stand there and look at them but you know you can stand there and watch people go by all day long and they pay no attention. Right. Isn't it amazing? When I lived in Nashville, I used to say, I'm, I'm going to uh, go into the tropics, usually in the wintertime. Yes. Oh, <laughs> you yes. Know? But I go there to work just to be in the atmosphere before I ever thought about going to you the rainforest. You feel different, don't you? Oh, yeah. yeah. You got the flowing water. Yeah. You got everything. I know I'm in a hotel, but it's the closest yeah. thing to the rainforest yeah. I can get in Nashville, Tennessee. Ideal temperature. Yeah. Okay, let's move on to Chapter 10. All right. And we talk about the strangler fig phenomenon. It's a lesson in, a lesson in timing. The thing about the strangler fig is this. <coughs> The seed is usually uh, planted by a bird. You know, the bird eats the fruit, the fig. It drops the seed, you know, uh, uh, when it relieves itself and it drops it on a branch and that becomes a, uh, it, it begins to, it can actually grow there, that particular thing, and it begins to send roots down to the, through the air, down to the ground. When it reaches that, then it starts stabilizing itself 
and eventually it surrounds itself, wraps itself around the host tree and consumes the host tree, devours it and becomes a great tree in and of itself. Now if you were, to, that process takes decades, but if you were to watch that Herman, if, if God could speed that process up and you watch it in 15 minutes, it would frighten you to death. You'd come screaming running out of the rainforest if you could see it happen that quick. But fortunately, it happened slowly. But there are four phases, and there are four phases of the rainforest, four phases of everything in this regard. So let's talk about that. Okay, you start <laughs> out with of the sons of Issachar. They had understanding of the times. They knew their times. And they knew what Israel ought to do. And that's something important. What are the times that we're living in? Well, people always th think about end times. Well, that's important, but I'm going to go beyond that. There are seasons of life that we go through, okay? Uh, for example, when you're a child, sometimes a child, you know, they believe in Santa Claus. That's the first st stage. Then they get a little older, they don't believe in Santa Claus. Then they get a little older and they get married, have their own kids. Then they are Santa Claus. And then, and then finally, when they get really old, they start looking like Santa Claus. Yeah, right. <laughs> Those are the four yeah. faces Hello. of life. <laughs> okay. okay, so uh, I'm working on number four. But in, in nature, you see these four phases. And the first one I want to talk about, this is important because it happens in business. And you've got to know, you must, like Issachar, discern what season am I in, what season is my industry in, what season is our economy in, what is the season. When you don't discern them, you're just leaving it to chance. Oh. So know your seasons. Number, number one, one, innovation. This is a new idea is implemented. And Isaiah 43 says, see, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Zechariah says, don't despise the day of small <coughs> beginnings. This is the innovation phase. This is the, I've got an idea. Yeah. This is, I, I, I'm building a prototype. I think this works. It's the innovation that says there's a whole new way. We don't have to have horse and buggy. We can have a car. We don't have to have carbon paper. We can have a photocopier. We, you know, all kinds of innovations that have come down the pike through history are, are some of them are, are, are tremendous in their size and scope. But it's the innovation sa stage when somebody says, I've got a new process, or I've got a new product, wow. or I've got a new thing. Isn't it amazing? The iPhone in my pocket, mm -hmm. that's a computer. Yes, you know it. You should take a room this size. Yeah, sure. Amazing. That's, that's okay, let's move on. <coughs> so after the innovation, the new idea is implemented. You've got number two, it's the growth phase. You have a working did we model. Did we cover the verses? We did in, in, in okay. ver number one. Very good. All right. Let's Phase go. two, growth. You have a working model. Now grow it. The Bible says be fruitful, then multiply. Yes. Okay, you got to multiply. So, look, it's, it's this. You go to McDonald's, uh, the McDonald Brothers in California in the 50s. Ray Kroc went out there because he wanted to find out. He was in Chicago. Why does somebody need, I forget how many it was, six or eight new milkshake makers? And he sold milkshake makers. He sold milkshake makers for a company in Chicago, and this restaurant wanted, I think it was a half a dozen of them. He said, I'm going to fly out there to see what in the see, world. See, this is the kind of thing you would do. Yeah, yeah. Like, go, I want to see what's going on. I, I don't understand. Like, you, a restaurant needs one. Yeah. Why do you need so many? Yeah. So he flew out there to see, and they had this whole system for making hamburgers, and people were lined up for it. And it was the McDonald brothers, and they called it McDonald's. Well, he thought... I, see, that was an innovation. The way they did their hamburgers, the way they do it now, all fast food restaurants do it, was an innovation. And the McDonald brothers came up with the innovation. Ray Kroc came along and said, we can franchise this thing. Let's grow. So he bought it. He bought it. Yeah. <coughs> and he grew it. So the growth phase is when you say, God says, listen to this. This is important. Genesis 128. When it says, be fruitful and multiply, first step is, is it fruitful? Does it work? Is it a working idea? Make sure it works. Test it out. Okay, this really works. We know it works. It's a good thing. So that's, that's the, don't put the cart before the horse. Right. Make sure it's fruitful, yeah. and then multiply. Simple thing. Be fruitful, then multiply. Number three is mature. Diversification. Multiple income streams is an example. What happens is <coughs> the tree, it's growing, but it gets to its height, 50 feet or 200 feet or whatever the height is, okay? And the... the the Bible says in, in Psalm 37, I've seen the wicked in great power spreading himself like a green bay tree. What happens is it hits its potential height. It's as big as it's ever going to be. And now it, it, it kind of goes out sideways, if you will. A tree, and, it's, and then, then it starts producing faithfully, consistently. So in a business, for example, one of the things you want to do is diversify. Okay. Uh, you can pick any 3M. They started with one product, and then they had another one, another one, another one, and they kept innovating, growing a product, and diversifying and diversifying, and getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Any successful company has done that. Coca-Cola. Well, you know, I think they sell more water than they sell Coke. 
I'm not sure about that, but they, <coughs> they diversified a little bit. Any, large, any company, once it's grown to a certain stage, will say, okay, how do I get bigger? Um, Amazon as an example, was books. Now you can buy a car on Amazon. You can buy anything on Amazon. They got to a stage, they said, okay, now let's let's go wide. Yeah. We went up, now we go wide. That's that, why the book was written, Who Moved the Cheese? That's if right. If you don't keep up with innovation, you're out of business. This is phase three. It's all about the maturing phase. And, and a, a lot of business was, will stay in that phase for a long time, but ultimately, as always, you find in phase number four is when the, when the tree gets hit by lightning, it goes into, a, or, or, or just dies, it goes into a phase of decline and release. The old gives way to the new. They'll show, and, and a good example of that is in uh, Isaiah 11. It says, there shall come forth a branch from the stump of Jesse. Isaiah 11, 1, okay, which is, is referring to Jesus, of course. But what we see is the old is given way and the new comes forward. And that happens in the rainforest all the time. You'll see these massive trees that eventually they die. But when they do, out of them springs the new. Okay? So a business doesn't necessarily have to die for that, although obviously most do. Most companies in the 1800s are not in existence today. Yeah, yeah. Most in the 1900s aren't. But <clears throat> you don't have to die. You have to continually innovate. You have to continually say, okay, we used to be this, now we're that. We used to be a rail, now we're a trans transportation company or, 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 or whatever. You have to broaden their scope. Now, now how does that relate to spiritual life? Okay, people get stuck. People get stuck. Okay, when you're a Christian, hey, uh, in the, it's a new thing, I, I'm saved. I'm, I'm, you know, they're ex perhaps excited about that. Uh, then they begin to grow. They, they, they go to the church, they read the Bible, they're just, they, they, but everything is new to them and they're just growing and growing. People say, man, you're really coming along. But then there comes a time when their maturity, when they begin to give out. Now they're teaching. Now they're mature. The excitement's gone. Well, it doesn't have to be gone. There may be a mature intensity. It's just like when you got married. You know, everybody's excited when they get married. But you don't have to lose the excitement. But what happens a lot of times, in a good sense, and, and I told this to my wife, Judy. I said, I'm waiting with anticipation for our fifth anniversary. I said, you think you love me now? You think I love you now? We do. We're crazy about each other, but you wait. I said, three years from now, four years from now, five years from now, when that has gotten deeper and there's maturity to it, my word, I want that. I want that. I want the maturity. Same thing with the Lord, okay? When you're young in the Lord, you think, well, this is good stuff, and I'm, and I'm so excited. Oh, look, it, it says this, and whatever scripture, you know, gets you excited. But there comes a time when you mature, and now you're just... You're not about the fizz anymore. You're just like, God, I just want to sit at your feet. I just want to sit. And, and I lay on the floor sometimes. I, you know, I, I was a little early this morning, so I didn't. But yesterday, I, I spent I don't know how much time just on my knees. You don't have to be, but I did. I just, Lord, you're so amazing. You're so massive. You're so, and I just take him in. Yeah. Okay, yeah, wow. there's a maturing. Wow. And then ultimately, uh, the decline and release and for us as Christians is when we, it's our time to move on and, t and go into a heaven, but we leave behind us a testimony, a legacy. You're talking about me here. <laughs> You're next. <No. laughs> <laughs> decline and release. The old gives way to the new. I, I love that. Isaiah 11, 11, 1. That is wonderful. There shall come forth a branch from the stump of Jesse. Mm -hmm. So we have things to move toward. We're not dead yet. We're not dead yet. And, and the thing is, out of, out of, hopefully, out of our legacy, out of what we've laid a foundation for, others will stand on our shoulders. Others will take what we have and go forward. I've often wished that, you know, I, I sort of stepped away from uh, public life for a few years. And when I did that, I thought, well, surely other people are going to teach the biblical materials I teach on sales and business and all that. But nobody that I'm aware of stepped up into that into that place. You're correct. You know, and, and it's a little yeah. surprising to me because I think yeah. it's it's so profound. Let's go to chapter eleven, the, the Brazil nut effect. <laughs> Here we go. I love this. This look at this it called the Brazil nut effect for one reason. There's a critter in the rainforest called an agouti. He's like a, about the size of a large cat, uh, but he's a rodent. And uh, could be make like a small dog, maybe, in terms of their size. And they're rodent. What's unique about them is they ha they're the only creature in the entire rainforest with jaws that are strong enough and teeth that are sharp enough to be able to crack open a Brazil nut. Wow. Now, Brazil nut, I always thought what you buy in the store, those hard shells. I did not realize, if you notice the shape of them, they're kind of like a the shape like the section of an orange. That's because those what we buy in the store comes in a pod the size of a grapefruit. And the shell that's around that, no other creature can open except for the agouti. So here's the thing. 
Okay, so the Brazil nuts, like, man, I got so much selenium in my, in my Brazil nuts, you're gonna love these. I got so much nutrition, you're gonna love this, but nobody can eat it. And, and, and the tree says, hey, listen, I, I, I wanna grow my franchise. I'd like to have a tree over there and another one over there, and, but I can't get over there because I have no mobility. So he makes a deal with, with the agouti. He says, I'm gonna produce more Brazil nuts than you'll ever be able to eat, you and your family. All I need you to do is take some of them, please, and go down the river a little bit and bury them there so, and plant them there for me. So the agouti says, sure, why not? And so he gets, he eats it to the full, he takes some of them and he hides them for later, to eat later, but you know what? He gets eaten by a jaguar or something else, or he dies, or a hawk gets him or something. And this so is the rainforest. This is the rainforest, yeah. Yeah, okay, so he doesn't get it. So what happens is that the, occasionally those Brazil nuts will become seedlings and become trees and reproduce, and so now the tree's happy. So what happened there? Think about this, you have to think. This is, use your brain a little bit, okay? A sanctified common sense and by the spirit. What actually happened there? There's a transaction. The tree had an abundance, and it traded what it had in abundance for what it didn't have. And the agouti had an abundance of mobility, had an abundance of energy. It could run around and scamp around, but it didn't have the food. And the jaws to get through it. Oh, it had that, it had, it yeah. had what it needed. Yeah. So that they make a deal. This is called a symbiotic relationship. They made a deal to swap out with each other. So, was this a surprise to God? God made, I mean, if I went into the depth of this, yeah, it is so deep, just on the Brazil tree. Wonderful? <coughs> but I don't have time to get into that, but I do in the book. But the thing is, in the, this process, I, I was sitting with, uh, at the time, the, the guy that was the editor for Success Magazine. <coughs> Been around since the early 1900s, that magazine at the time. And uh, they wanted me to do some sales training. I have a Selling Among Wolves biblically-based training program. They wanted me to do some training for their uh, uh, to sell advertising for their, you know, their agents that they had. At the time they were selling advertising, one page ad was $63,000 for a full page ad. And uh, they said, how much would you charge for a day of training? And I remember saying to him, what's money between friends? He looked at me like, you do this for free? No, no, no. I said, all I want is a piece of paper. He said, what do you mean a piece of paper? I said, I don't even want a whole piece of paper. I just want one side of a piece of paper. At which point the lights went on, I'll, tr I'll do some training if you'll give me a full page ad in the magazine and run it for a year, which at the time was six issues, which had a value to me of $300,000. A cost to them, but they had it in excess. Oh, another sheet, we got unsold advertising, no problem. So it was no cost to them, it was excess but to you them. you Solomon's idea. Yeah, yeah, it was, <laughs> but it was, but it, it was excess yeah. to them, and then I traded what I had, knowledge, and the good thing is when I gave them my knowledge, I was not depleted. So I can trade these things. Yeah. So that, that is how that works. So let's take a look at this. Number one. Number one, there's opportunistic relationships. Okay, uh, in the rainforest there are four kinds of relationships. Number one is opportunistic. Grow by preparing for and seizing opportunities. As Ephesians says, make the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. I had a friend who moved down to Tampa uh, a few years back, uh, in, I remember, 08 I think it was, and um, he rented a big beautiful home on the water, multi-million dollar home, rented it because they were, they were panicked about what was happening in the mar market. So they gave him to him at a ridiculous price. I mean, ridiculously low rental price. It was so ridiculous that he asked for and got a seven year lease. Right after he did this, this was in November, he realized that the, the, the Super Bowl was coming to Tampa. And so he then put it up for rent for a 10 day period during the Super Bowl. Some NFL player rented it and paid for his entire first year of rent and for the furnishings that he needed to put in there, like the, the, the hot tub and a few other things he had to add to it to make it really nice, and he rented it. It was an opportunity. He seized an opportunity. In the rainforest, there are opportunistic relationships. But you've got to see them. You've got to see them. You've got to act, you've got to act on them. Number two. Parasitic. You've got to avoid those relationships because that only drain you. What does Romans say? This is one of other scriptures. But avoid them which cause divisions. There's a place where you say, you know what, this is, this is not healthy. In business, some would argue, and I can understand it, that a certain amount of banking relationships might be parasitic in their nature. This is a good verse for people <laughs> in church. Avoid them which cause divisions. Yeah. Parasitic relationships that suck you dry, that drain you, yeah. that don't put anything in, you got to be careful with that. Number the three. third type is symbiotic. Build mutually rewarding relationships. A couple examples in the Bible, Hebrews 3, 13, exhort one another daily. That's a give and take, okay? Or in Ecclesiastes, though one may be empowered by another, two can withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. A mutually rewarding relationship is where in the, in, in the rainforest, 
I scratch your back, you scratch mine. I help you, you help me. And if you do that right, if you do that well, you will get more return than you will ever do by doing it with cash. That's wow. why, when possible, don't use cash. Use the, leverage the relationships to get this done. Wow. It's absolutely huge. Number four. Mutualistic. Uh, cultivate mutually dependent relationships. The Bible says, if the whole body be an eye, where would be the hearing? What we're saying here, <coughs> Excuse me. What we're saying is the difference between symbiotic and mutualistic. Symbiotic says, you help me, I help you. Thank you. Mutualistic says, I, I can't make it without you. Wow. You can't make it without me. Let's recognize that. Relationship. Yeah, it's a deeper relationship yeah. than a convenience. Yeah. Hey, scratch my back. Sure, I'll scratch yours. That's good. Yeah. But mutualistic is a dependence. Wow. wow. Chapter 12, let's move on. The orchard. Ella orchid. Or orchid, excuse me, orchid, orchid. Yeah, the 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 orchid element. In fact, I was talking about that in yeah. in the Opryland Hotel, where the orchids are the most gorgeous flowers, just kind of suspended in air. Uh huh. And t tell this process because this is this is really important. Well, okay, I got to tell you this as a as a bit of a story. We got we got about eight minutes, seven minutes. Thank you. When I was in the rainforest, one of the things that absolutely struck me is that you're walking in essentially a sea of green. Everything is green, but occasionally your eye will be, look at that, that white flower, that orange flower, that yellow flower, that's, it's an orchid hanging there, and you're, at least I am, riveted by that. Absolutely. Your attention is drawn yes. by that. And for me, I go off the trail, I go over to that thing. I wanna study it, I wanna photograph it, I wanna examine that, I'm, I'm, a, I'm compelled by it. It's such a powerful thing that I realized when I was actually in, in, in this, the orchid element, uh, the Smithsonian scientist that was giving us a private guided tour pointed out a tree that had nothing but flowers on it, no leaves. And she explained that we're in the dry season and therefore the tree has cast off all its leaves to conserve resources, but it produces the flowers. And I said, why does it do that? She said, well, that's about marketing. Marketing, she said, yeah, if, if times get tough and they lose the water, they still must market. In fact, it's been proven that companies that marketed through any recession and kept their, their <coughs> like the Great Recession in the 70s, for example, there were certain companies that kept advertising when everybody else was pulling back, and they did a study on them five years later. They had grown, I forget, 200 and something percent compared to either not being in business or only very modest growth. So during the dry season, if you will keep doing it, if you will keep doing that, you will get a tremendous growth. So she was pointing all this out to me and explaining how this works. And so I thought, okay, this is an amazing, uh, an amazing element here. Uh, I'm gonna learn about marketing from the orchid. I wanna see how this works. And good marketing, as I say, is about, uh, more about communicating with somebody yes. than it is about selling to somebody. But we've got, we've got some things here, seven things to go through. Okay, let's go. Seven natural constants. <clears throat> that teach us to tailor our message to attract ideal c customers. What we see in the rainforest, look at this, color. Color draws you. Color is, you go, why goodness, that's red, that's green. And certain bugs, by the way, are, they go nuts when they see a certain color. It attracts them. Wow. So we see color is used in that, and, and of course we do that in advertising, we'll talk about I, that later. I love hummingbirds, you <coughs> point out in the book that they only like red and orange. Yeah, they, they, they go for a specific color, yeah. that's right. And so everything is, is created to attract a specific customer. So there, there's an idea we could get for real life, <coughs> that things attract us. So if you want more business or you want to right. get the attention of somebody, do what nature has taught but you. Yeah, that, I'm learning from what, uh, that, and that's why when you go to McDonald's, you don't see McDonald's with blues and greens. Or you don't see, they, they're in oranges and reds because those colors stimulate appetite. Yeah. <laughs> so okay. when you go in there, you're a hummingbird. <coughs> That's right. And fragrance. A fragrance, okay. That's another thing that attracts you is that the smell. It's, a, it's one of the senses. I can see the color. I can smell the fragrance, and wow. that stimulates something. A third one is uh, shape, the shape of, of a particular flower in the, in the rainforest. We see there's one called the bee orchid, and the orchid looks like a bee. It's, it has the coloring and, and shape of, uh, of a bee, and so what happens is, it attracts other male bees, but it's a flower, and the male bees come and they try to mate with it, okay? They think, that's a, that's a female bee, but it's not. But in the process of trying to do that, they get frustrated, but they, they pollinate, and that's what they're after. My and goodness. so we see that shape is an important thing. Size. Size, you know, <clears throat> size determines who's gonna come. Uh, certain uh, large things attract certain, 
uh, like monkeys and, and small ones attract different uh, pollinators. Timing. Timing has to do with like... Well, that's in, a whole sermon right there. Oh, well, sure. But in the rainforest... Everything is according to timing. Timing is important. There are certain... In the rainforest, there are certain flowers that only open up at night. Therefore, wow. guess what? They're marketing to bats. Wow. Location. Location. Where they're at. Where, you know, where do you place your ads? Where, where, are, the, where are they? Is it on the free? Where, where do I see this? Medium. Medium. The medium is the message. You know, you put a flyer on somebody's window in a, in a, in a mall parking lot, you don't like that. You see it on television, you go... This looks credible to me. Yeah. That's the kind of thing we're talking about. Seven natural laws of marketing. Okay, number one, this is what the flowers do. We teach about it, but we don't have time in this to go through it, but in the book it's very detailed. Make a powerful promise. You don't want to say, you know what, this ain't half bad. You, you make a powerful, factual, emphasis on the word factual, promise. Number two, offer a compelling solution. Number three, outline the meaningful benefits. Number four, you've got to establish impeccable credibility. Number five, you've got to craft an irresistible offer. And number six, develop a legitimate sense of urgency. Flowers do this all the time. Yes. Hey, I'm only here for a season. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's gone. Yeah, yeah. It's real. We it's only not have fake. two of these left. Yeah. But it's true. Yeah. Well, you know, you don't fake it, but when it's true, it's true. And number seven, you give a clarion call to action. These seven natural laws we see over and over again manifest in the rainforest by every tree that must market, that must attract new customers. We talk about in the book how you can take those seven things and what it looks like in real business, whether it's online marketing or retail marketing or what have you, and we use these principles to grow our business. Now let me also remind you that, and by the way, the, the reason I have this <laughs> bottle here is actually, you talked about it in the book on page six, this berry is actually in the rainforest. Yep. And they have marketed it until it's a health drink. Mm -hmm. That's right. And God figured that out a long time ago. Probably the animals in there are enjoying life because of that berry. They are. And sure. now you translate that to the human body and God says, I was wondering when you're gonna figure this out. Right. It's like the aspirin came from. Uh, and uh, my point is that, that, yeah, there's tremendous wealth yeah. and resources there. And get them, yes. get them already, yes. get that. But and this, get information. Is, this is your opportunity. This is a four-part series that we've had the privilege of coming into your home. And if you only got one of them, get the DVD and you can have all four of them. Maybe you saw all four of them and you want to repeat it to some friends that you have over and show them what you have absolutely opened your mind to things you never thought possible. And if you get your book, as I have, it is one of the greatest resources you'll have. There is so much detail in here. It's information that it took Michael Pink three years to put it together and to put it on these pages so that you would have it. God bless you. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching It's Time. If you have recently made a decision for Christ, Herman and Sharon would like to hear from you.